I plan to speak for about 10 minutes um, and give more, more time for questions uh, at the end because I think that's more, more interesting. And um, I'm going to address three main issues. One is uh, the Balfour Declaration, although I will not say as much because that's kind of been covered already. Um, but then I will say something about how the, the, the Balfour Declaration was incorporated into the Palestine mandates and, and, and what happened during the League of Nations uh, period. Um, and then the third and final point will be looking at the end of the mandate, um, the, and particularly the 1939 White Paper. And then I might come up with some kind of proposal uh, that might tie into current events today. So as we've heard uh, this morning, the Balfour Declaration was one of uh, a series of um, pledges, uh, along with the same McMahon correspondence, the Sykes-Picot and the Sykes-Picot agreements. But there was also the Anglo-French Declaration, which hasn't been mentioned. That was a joint British-French declaration, uh, which spoke of um, uh, ascertaining the wishes of the communities living in, in the Levant at the time. And that's quite an important and overlooked declaration, because similar, similar language is then found in the Conference of the League of Nations, and particularly in Article 22, which speaks of the well-being and development of the people subject to mandatory rule, which would form a sacred trust of civilization. Uh, the language that was used in the Balfour Declaration was uh, very specific, as has been mentioned. Uh, a national, the, word, national, the phrase national home was used. Uh, the the, the uh, declaration was provisional, spoke of civil and religious rights of, of the uh, non-Jewish community, who are over 90% of the population, but also the political uh, rights of Jews in any other country, and we heard that these were inserted at the last minute due to uh, opposition from Lord Curzon and Lord Montagu. Um, the point here that I think is, is worth saying is that it was uh, the Balfour Declaration it was, a, it was a statement of policy, a statement of intent, um, that then was enshrined in the, in the mandate system. But as soon as this was attempted, uh, it ran into, into a serious problem because Article 22 speaks of self-determination, self-government of the certain communities uh, formerly inhabiting the Turkish Empire, which is usually understood to refer to the indigenous inhabitants. So how, how can you have the Balfour Declaration, which seeks to establish a national home in a country where the overwhelming majority of the people are opposed to that very um, agenda? And this is obviously Churchill and Balfour were aware of this uh, at the time. And uh, there's an, a letter which I quote in, in my book, which is from um, Balfour to, to um, Lloyd George. And he made the, the following point. He said, uh, this is uh, quoting Balfour, he said, The weak point of our position, of course, is that in the case of Palestine, we deliberately and rightly decline to accept the principle of self-determination. If the present inhabitants were consulted, they would unquestion unquestionably give an anti-Jewish verdict, by which he meant anti-immigration verdict. He said... The justification for our policy is that we regard Palestine as being absolutely exceptional, that we consider the question of Jews outside, as, outside Palestine as one of world importance, and that we conceive the Jews to have a historic claim to a home in their ancient land, provided, provided, he said, that home can be given them without either dispossessing or oppressing the present inhabitants. And we, and we now know it was a benefit of hindsight. That's exactly what happened. Uh, in the last years of the mandate. But that kind of gives you an interpretation of what Balfour himself understood by the provision uh, re regarding the uh, civil and religious rights of the non-Jewish community. Now, um, once we turn to the mandate, if you look at the, the mandate, you'll see that uh, the Balfour Declaration finds expression in the preamble, uh, in Article 2, and then in Article 6, the British government's encouraged um, to um, provide a, a, an immigration uh, regime that will allow Jews to immigrate to Palestine quite uh, easily, although, again, it's, it's also worded conditionally. So the language that is used is that, again, the administration of Palestine, while ensuring that the rights and the position of the other sections of the population are not prejudiced, shall facilitate, shall facilitate Jewish immigration. And, in fact, it was on this provision... Uh, in 1939, that the British government decides to restrict uh, Jewish immigration and to qualify uh, what they mean by the national home. So the expression national home is actually defined in the 1922 Churchill White Paper. You can Google it and find out. Uh, it, it, it did not, it, it was ambiguous, as we've heard, but uh, it wasn't, uh, the word state was deliberately um, avoided. 
But even though the Balfour Declaration is in the mandate, it's, it's still framed as a discretion. So it's a policy that, that the United Kingdom government could change uh, as circumstances uh, arose. Um, and so as we approach the mid-1930s, as the, the rise of national socialism in Germany, Jewish persecution, uh, and things in the Mediterranean are heating up with the Abyssinia crisis, uh, there's a revolt in Palestine, the Arab revolt from 1936 to 39. Uh, Britain's man on the ground, the High Commissioner Arthur Walcott, starts saying, you know, this is ridiculous, we're denying self-government to the Palestinians, uh, we should maybe change this policy. And then it goes to the Parliament here, and uh, Parliament blocks it, except the one member of the Communist Party says, you know, we should give the, 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 the Arabs a majority rule. But then within a year, you have the Peel Commission, and you have uh, Ormsby Gore, one of the authors of the Balfour Declaration, goes to the Permanent Mandates Commission in Geneva, and he says the, the Balfour Declaration was simply a statement of policy uh, you know, that was set at the end of the war. Uh, circumstances had changed, and the Balfour Declaration must disappear. That's actually, he uses the words, must disappear. And when we look at the 1939 White Paper, it speaks of self-government for Arabs and Jews in an independent Palestinian state who will share authority in governments. They, don't, they then say, we don't know how, they, how, the, how that will actually work out in the end, but that's the, that's the long-term goal. In 10 years, there will be an independent Palestinian state. Now, interestingly, the Jewish agency was not happy at all about the white paper, um, and they uh, formulated a document. I'll just read out what, how they interpreted the, the white paper. They said that the new policy for Palestine laid down by the mandatory in the white paper now issued denies to the Jewish people the right to rebuild their national home in their ancestral country. It transfers authority over Palestine to the present Arab majority and puts the Jewish population at the mercy of that majority. I'm just saying this to give perspective to what we've heard uh, about the Balfour Declaration in 1917, but things did change uh, two decades later. Now, one interesting question might be, why, why did the British government change its, I mean, do a complete U-turn uh, in 1939? We can say because there was going to be a great war and, you know, the British government wanted uh, things to be questioned in Palestine. But I've done a bit of digging uh, at the British Library here, uh, especially the Indian archives. Uh, and uh, and, in, and this, this will tie into my final concluding remarks. Uh, there was an attempt by Muhammad Ali Jinnah and the um, Indian um, Muslim League in 1938 to challenge British policy in, in Palestine because of the uh, unrest there, the status of word about the holy places in, in Jerusalem. And uh, there was a roundtable conference uh, this is right after the, the publication of the Hussein Mahmoud correspondence. Um, and they travelled to London and Jinnah sent some lawyers down. Jinnah, of course, himself was a barrister, Lincoln's in here. And uh, they, the British government not, would not allow them to attend the, the White Table Conference, so the, the delegation advised the Arabs from behind the scenes. But one of the issues that they looked at was um, bringing a, 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 a court case against the uh, British that, uh, the mandate has a clause in it under Article 26. There's a dispute between two mandatory powers over the interpretation of the mandate. So, for instance, over the interpretation of the Balfour Declaration, uh, you know, in line with what Article 22 said, you could refer, you, you could bring a case against another member of the League. India was a member of the League of Nations, so was uh, so. The idea was to whether India could have brought a case against the United Kingdom. And this group of lawyers then travelled to Geneva, and they met with Edouard de Halle, the uh, the uh, director of the, uh, the uh, mandate section in Geneva, um, and then it kind of goes cold because then the, the war uh, breaks out. But it's, it's still an interesting uh, case because if you look at what the uh, revisionist rights in Israel, how they justify settlements in the West Bank and Gaza, if you look closely at the, some of the writings, and including by scholars like Eugene Rostow, Julius Stone, or you go on the websites of the uh, government of the State of Israel, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you'll see that there's always this reference to the Balfour Declaration and the mandates as giving a, 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 a legal right for Israel to settle um, its citizens in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, if that's the case, does that mean, I don't know, but does that mean that the mandate in, in, in the official position of the Israeli government is still in force? And if that is the case, could another member, of, a former member of the League of Nations today bring a, a claim against the United Kingdom for violations of international law during the last years of the mandate? Uh, because of the, the mandate was terminated on the 15th of May 1948, but the big expulsions, uh, the Nakba, began earlier, began uh, um, in April, in April and May. 350,000 Palestinians already fled while British forces and troops were still in nominal control. So 
So the question arises, is there an international obligation there? Uh, the United Kingdom had the consent of the UN General Assembly to end the mandate by having a partition plan, but in January 1948, Britain blocks the uh, Palestine Commission in the UN partition plan, prevents it traveling from New York to, to, uh, to Palestine. Um, Avi Shlem uh, has documented that in January 1948, there was a secret agreement between the, the British government and the um, rulers of Transjordan to, if you like, kill the Palestinian state in the UN partition plan. Some questions that might arise is whether this could be uh, bring a claim to um, and the final thoughts are, what would stop Palestine or even an NGO from some hard work starting an international claim for the the permanent court of arbitration in the Hague since Palestine is now. I'll leave it there and thank you for listening.